Um, if you, uh, a lot of the verses will be on the screen, but if you have your Bible and you want to follow along, you'll be looking from verses 1 to 10. It's all of chapter 3 today. Um, this is part 3, our third week in the book of Jonah. Um, we covered the first two chapters the last two weeks, and as he mentioned, next week we'll finish the book of Jonah. Um, in our study, we continue to think differently and think God's way. And here's a brief review. If you haven't uh, been here the last two weeks, there's a brief review of the first two chapters from Jonah. So the Lord told Jonah to go and cry against Nineveh, and Jonah refused. The Lord rearranged Jonah's plans, and the Lord got Jonah thrown off a ship. The Lord saved the sailors of the ship, and then he arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah and to hold Jonah in its stomach for three days and three nights. Jonah then prayed to the Lord, and the Lord restored fellowship with Jonah. Then the Lord had Jonah spit up on the dry land. The Lord used this experience 800 years later as the sign of Jonah to represent the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And the example of the book of Jonah is needed by all of us when we consider who should receive God's mercy and compassion. What if God wants to use you to show them his great mercy? And this is one of the primary reasons for the book of Jonah, to highlight how great God's mercy is. Some background as we get into chapter 3. Now, in the book of Jonah, we see God's compassion, multiple miracles, and the sign of Jonah as a type of Christ. And Jesus, in the New Testament, unmistakably regards it as historical. Some historical notes about this section. In chapter 3, Jonah cries out the warning to Nineveh, and Nineveh repents. God likely had prepared the people and leaders of Nineveh through the circumstances for the reception of his warning message. When Jonah had the message to give, it's amazing how quickly, to us, it's amazing how quickly they responded. Well, consider how God had prepared them. Let's look at some history. Uh, the way the Old Testament tells us, and the New Testament also is, sometimes the ground is too hard for God to get things to grow in it. So he has to break it up. Consider from Hosea this. Sow for yourselves with a view to righteousness. Harvest in accord with kindness. Break up your uncultivated ground. So in order to sow and in order to harvest, they have to first break up the ground. Loosen it up a little bit. For it's time to seek the Lord until he comes and rains righteousness on you. So the Lord has been preparing Nineveh, breaking up the ground, getting it ready for Nineveh. Here are some historical notes. Uh, from 793 to 753, Jonah ministered as prophet during the reign of Jeroboam, the king of Israel, which is the northern of the two kingdoms. In 765 BC, Nineveh was hit by a major plague. Nineveh's military was weakened. And then in 763 BC, there was a total solar eclipse. God is starting to get their attention. Then Nineveh had an earthquake in 760. In 759, Nineveh had a second major plague. And then finally in 759 later that year, Jonah went to Nineveh with a warning from God. They were now ready. These historical events created the circumstances for those in Nineveh to be prepared to question what might be going on. This thing doesn't stay in there, sorry. So when Jonah began to preach, the people of Nineveh were prepared to be receptive to the warning from the Lord. Sometimes God does this, where he uses other events and other circumstances to prepare people for messages, for warnings, for revivals, for other things like that in history, God prepares the hearts of people. 
Jonah is now coming to Nineveh with this preparation by the Lord for the warning he's going to give. And today we continue our study starting in Jonah chapter 3. Here's the outline of the book, Jonah fleeing, Jonah praying, Jonah preaching, and Jonah learning. Today we'll look at chapter 3. Jonah preaches, Nineveh repents, God shows mercy. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying. Now in chapter 1 and in chapter 3, they begin identically with the exception of the middle phrase, the son of Amittai, the son of truth, versus the second time. So now that the Lord has moved Jonah through the process to get him to obey, he just repeats his request. He just repeats it the same as he did in the first chapter. We have a God of second chances and third chances and so on. I'm so glad that God doesn't give up on us. Who is a God like you? who pardons wrongdoing and passes over a rebellious act of the remnant of his possession. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. God is accustomed to giving us second chances. The one who steals, however, after you get the second chance, the one who steals must no longer steal, but rather he must labor, producing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with one who has need. So the reason that he gives you a second chance is so that you can be redemptive to others. So steal no longer. Obey. Yes, indeed, we have a God of second chances. But don't presume upon God. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Far from it. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? So don't just be presumptuous and think, oh, well, God will forgive me anyway. I might as well just go ahead and do it. That's the wrong idea here. So arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. Arise, go to Nineveh. Now, Jonah had taken a detour to get there, but he's now finally going to Nineveh. Jonah took a few days to go from Gath Hepper to Joppa, then a few days on the ship in the stomach of the great fish, then likely about a month to go from the Sea of Nineveh, uh, from the sea to Nineveh. So on the Mediterranean Sea, whether Jonah was uh, thrown onto the, the shore at Joppa or somewhere north, from anywhere along that edge of the sea to where Nineveh is is between five and six hundred miles. It takes about a month to walk that far. 20, 30 miles a day, five, 600 miles, you do the math. God continues the second time for Jonah. The great city. It is great because God says it's important. We'll see later why this is. And proclaim to it the proclamation. So this is a, a repeated word, proclaim the proclamation. Call to them the call. Proclaim it to the proclamation. Preach to the preaching. That's the idea here. It's just a repeated phrase. Proclaim the proclamation. It's a Hebrewism that says, do this and do it what I tell you, which I am going to tell you. I will tell you exactly what to say. You don't need to add anything. You don't need to take anything away. Say what I'm going to tell you. So Jonah arose, went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, the first time Jonah flees, this time he obeys. According to the word of the Lord, do what God says. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. In Hebrew, this is literally, Nineveh has become to Elohim an important city. It is exceedingly great because God considers it important. That's the idea here. The word Elohim is used where the translators have said exceedingly. Sometimes they do that with Hebrewisms, but uh, the idea literally is it has become to God an important city. It is exceedingly great. This clarifies the greatness. It is great because it's important to God. God considers Nineveh great because of his plan to show them mercy. 
He's going to show them his great mercy and show us his great mercy. And in the future, his plan is to use these events to show in the future the sign of Jonah and the final judgment to the testimony of the Ninevites against those who would not believe the witness of Jesus. He has great plans to use this to testify to his name. It's a three days walk. This is a visit, a travel, or a journey. Now the emphasis here is on the length of time the visit would take, not the distance of the visit. Let's look at this a little bit. Then the king said to me, this is from Nehemiah, the queen sitting beside him, how long will your journey be? The word journey there is the same word we have in, in Jonah where it says the three days walk, three days journey. And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I gave him a definite time. So the idea here is how long will your journey be is not how far it will be, but how long will it take? So the emphasis is not on the size of the travel, but on how long the travel will take. That's the idea. Additional historical notes here. At the time of Jonah, the city of Nineveh was much smaller than it would become in the next 50 years. It was still rising in, in its size. Now, some biblical critics say that Jonah did not accurately represent the size of the city of Nineveh because the city of Nineveh at the time of Jonah would not take three days to walk through it. That's the complaint that they have. A visit of three days in the ancient Near East would normally practice hospitality. So the trip would include these three days. The person would arrive, set up general meetings, set up uh, things to do. Then he would deal with the primary purpose of the visit. And then on the third day, the return, and they would wrap up. So that was the idea of the three-day visit. Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, yet 40 days in Nineveh will be overthrown. So Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk. So the first day of Jonah's visit was enough to accomplish the task. He didn't need any longer. We find out that on the first day, Jonah's introductory phase of entering the city, meeting a few people, figuring out where to go, was enough to trigger the entire city. And he cried out and said, he cried out, he called, he proclaimed, Yet 40 days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, in, in my English Bible, that's eight words. This message is five words in Hebrew. Five. Yet 40 days, Nineveh overthrown. Yet. Still to come are 40 days. Now, many biblical warnings use 40 days as warning messages. In the Bible, it's used as a period of testing or trial or probation. But it is still 40 literal days. Moses interceded on Israel's behalf for 40 days and 40 nights in Deuteronomy 9. So the period of 40 days is a period of trial or testing or probation. To Nineveh, this is to your city. To be overthrown is to be turned upside down this is a statement of judgment. This is expressing God's anger and wrath upon unrepentant Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the phrase that's used there for overthrown. Consider this from Genesis 19. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord of heaven, and he overthrew those cities. The same word that's used here in Jonah and all the surrounding area and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. He's serious about this. He's going to flip it around. Now, Jonah did not make up these words. They were dictated directly to him by the Lord. The Lord knows what he's doing. These words were enough. Probably the shortest revival message in history. Five words. That's it. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Five words, and they believed. Remember, they had been prepared. 
God had broken up the fallow ground. He had taken them, softened them up. They were ready to hear the message, and they heard it and were cut to the quick. The people of Nineveh, the people heard the message first and were prepared for the warning. They heard it and responded immediately. They believed in God. This is to stand firm, to trust, to be certain of, to believe in. The word is used a lot, 108 times in the Old Testament. The very first time is from Genesis 15. The men of Nineveh, uh, this is a reference to the New Testament referring to this. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will contemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. We're told in the New Testament that these people truly believed. They truly repented. Now, this statement in Matthew is a harsh condemnation. The Ninevites who only had the testimony of Jonah in five words, repented. The generation of religious Jews challenging Jesus in the first century have Jesus' testimony and the evidence of his life, and they did not repent. And that's why God gives them a dire warning. An interesting side note here on the last phrase in Matthew 12, 41. Jesus said, something greater than is here. Three times in Matthew 12, he says that phrase. And I was curious about it, and then I found somebody who helped me understand it, and here it is. I say to you, this is from Matthew 12, 6, something greater than the temple is here. Later in Matthew, we read this earlier, the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. And then in the next verse, the queen of the south will rise up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. We've got the temple, we've got Jonah, and we've got Solomon. And something greater than is here. What is this? Something greater than the temple, Jonah, and Solomon. The temple is the office of the priest. Jonah is the office of prophet. And Solomon is the office of king. So here, in Matthew 12, Jesus makes a claim to be all three, prophet, priest, and king. Now back to Jonah. That was just a sidebar, no charge. I thought it was fun, I thought I'd share it. Then they called a fast. Fasting was a sign of mourning. And they put on sackcloth. It was used by a penitent sinner. This was not something comfortable to wear. You put it on and it was itchy and scratchy and uncomfortable. Not like that nice, soft, cotton, silk stuff, you know, really sweetly soft and comfy. This thing was itchy and yucky. And it reminded me that I needed to do something. From the greatest to the least, everyone in the city responded. So when the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, So when the word reached, we find out that the king was now finding out after the people had heard. For some reason, he was one of the last to hear. The whole city knew, and then he finally finds out. A part of this has to do with the way politics work. Sometimes people are afraid to bring bad news to the king. But eventually, it's getting so loud that he hears, and he finds out. The king of Nineveh. Now, this is not likely the king of Assyria but rather we'd call him the governor of the province of Nineveh. Why is that? The word king here is the Hebrew word melech. Now the Akkadian word saknu, meaning governor, is translated into Hebrew with the Hebrew word melech in some bilingual inscription around 800 BC. And there's people that do this stuff and they find these rocks with these transcriptions and they find that it said melech and 
uh, and this Hebrew, uh, the uh, word for uh, governor is there together, and they get used interchangeably. So the king responds, the king or the governor of Nineveh responds, and he arose from his throne. He stepped away from his official position. He stepped down. He says, I got to step down. And I laid aside my robe. He put his robe aside. This is the symbol of his position as king. He's beginning to humble himself. He covered himself with sackcloth. He put on a penitent posture. And he sat on the ashes. He humbled himself down to the dust. Compare Jeremiah's warning of impending destruction of Jerusalem. Daughter of my people, put on sackcloth and roll in ashes. Mourn as for an only son, a bitter mourning, for suddenly the destroyer will come against us. It's a common practice for people that are repenting to humble themselves, put themselves down, fast. Take the time to put yourself in the ashes and mourn. Now he issues a proclamation, and it's said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. Now the proclamation is issued by the king and his nobles. He and the people of Nineveh are all in agreement. He issued a proclamation, and it said, in Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles. Decree here is a judgment or a mandate. Now today we are given mandates by political leaders. And many times mandates are not universally accepted or agreed upon. This is quite different here. Everyone, from the least to the greatest, from the king to all of his nobles, are all in agreement on this mandate. They're in agreement. Do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. This was a total fast for every person and domestic animal. No food or water at all. This was a sense of common misery. If all of Nineveh was going to be overthrown, it would include people and animals, so we should all be in mourning. Both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. Now continuing the proclamation, first fasting, now humility and misery. We note that even today, if you think about it, at funerals, Animals are covered with black velvet to make the seriousness of the event visible. It's not uncommon for animals to be included in these things. And let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way. And let men, that each one, here there are no exceptions. Nobody's going to be hiding in a corner. Nobody's going to be excluded from this. Everybody's included. To call earnestly. This is to call with strength, to call forcefully, or call mightily. And turn from. This carries the idea of turn away from, and also to turn towards the opposite of that. The word is used four times in these two verses. His wicked way. His wicked, evil, bad ways. This is what is contrary to God's will. It's a general statement about things that are evil and wicked and bad. Way here has to do with the way or the road or the path of life or the plan of life. This is normally what you do. You're normally rotten and bad and wicked and evil. We've got to turn away from being normally that way. We've got to be different. That's the idea. Stop being a jerk. Be good. 
and from the violence which is in his hands. Now more specifically for the Ninevites. They are to turn from their wicked ways, and this is expressed most terribly by the utter violence that they had. Remember in our introduction to the book, we talked about how terrible their violence was. When they would take over a nation, they would take the people that were the leaders in that nation, they would cut off their heads and stick them on a pole and hang them in public view. They would skin their captives alive. They were violent. That's their wickedness at its heart, was their violence. This violence is carried on the hands of each of them. They're all guilty. The idiom here, they have blood on their fingers, captures this quite well. The idea of their violence is there are no innocent hands in Nineveh. They're all guilty of this. They went along with it or they actively participated in it. They were all guilty. Who knows? He's finishing now. God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. Who knows? Who could tell? This this leader, this governor, this king is saying, who knows? The king doesn't know if God will be merciful with him. He doesn't know God that well. He doesn't know. But Jonah knows. In fact, we'll see in the upcoming chapter, Jonah's specific complaint and anger with the Lord is because the Lord does indeed have mercy on the Ninevites. That's why he didn't want to go there. Consider from Jonah 4.2. Then he prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, in anticipation of this, I fled to Tarshish, since I knew, I know you, Lord. I've been spending my life thinking about you, studying you. I know what you're like. You are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in mercy, and one who relents of disaster. I knew that if I went there and preached, they would have forgiveness from you. I knew that. That's the anger that Jonah expresses. Now, the king didn't know this, but he says, who knows, maybe God will relent. Jonah knew he would. The next subject is a bit challenging, and hopefully this summary will help. The king is saying, God may turn, to turn away from possible judgment and towards mercy, and relent. This is to have compassion and to show comfort. This Hebrew word is used mostly of God. The word repent is used of humans. The word relent is used mostly of God. God's nature and character are clear from his word. Scripture tells us that God is immutable and not changing. Consider from 1 Samuel. Also, the glory of Israel will not lie nor change his mind, for he is not a man that he would change his mind. He's not flippant. He doesn't just flip and change his mind. Scripture also tells us that God is merciful and compassionate and does change his dealings with men according to his sovereign purpose. God will say things in the Old Testament like, I have set before you life and death, Choose life. Now, depending on which one you choose, God will do one or the other. He's not changing his mind. He's responding to you. He's changing his dealings based on your behavior. So when we read here that in Jonah that God may turn and relent, we must consider how it is to be understood. It only appears that God has changed. But in fact, he's only expressing his immutable character. Because he is unchanging, because he is merciful, when you are repentant, he shows you mercy. And if you're not, he won't. That's the idea. He's showing compassion when he relents. If a man changes, then God is right to be merciful, and he shows compassion with comfort. 
And then he withdraws his burning, may withdraw his burning anger. This is still the king saying, and I hope he will withdraw his burning anger. This is to turn away from the kindling of anger. The phrase burning anger is the idea of kindling. Now, I just brought a whole bunch of kindling to my son. He has a fire pit out in the back. And this stuff is like flash paper. It is so dry and so light and thin. You put a match on it, it goes, whew. That's the idea of this burning anger. It's like flash paper. It gets hot really fast. That's the idea of this burning anger. It's a flash paper hot. God's anger is righteous. Now, he finally figures it out, and he says, the main goal of this for us to repent is so that God will allow us to not perish, to not be destroyed. The same word is used in chapter 410 of the plant that dies. He doesn't want to die. They want to live. Now we see God's observation of the Ninevites responding to his warning. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way. Their turning was observed by God. And God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them. Consider this passage from Jeremiah. At one moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot it, to tear it down, or to destroy it. I might do that. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I plan to bring it. So they have an option. And God's character lets him choose based on his merciful nature. If they relent, if they turn, I will heal them. I will take away the disaster I plan to bring on them. And he did not do it. The Hebrew word is very, very short here. He did not. He stopped. It's over. He showed them mercy instead of judgment. Instead of being overturned, they were let to be alive. He wasn't just ignoring their past behavior. He looked at the changes and determined it was proper to show them mercy. The Lord told Jonah to go and cry against Nineveh. Jonah refused. The Lord rearranged Jonah's plans, and the Lord got Jonah thrown off the ship. The Lord saved the ship of sailors, and Jonah arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah and hold Jonah in his stomach for three days and three nights. Jonah prayed to the Lord, and the Lord restored fellowship with Jonah. And the Lord had Jonah spit up on the dry land. The Lord used this experience 800 years later as the sign of Jonah, sorry, to represent the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The Lord then told Nineveh a second time to go and cry against Nineveh. This time, Jonah obeyed. The Ninevites believed and repented, and God showed them compassion. Next week, chapter 4, we're going to find out something. Jonah is angry with God. He's angry with him. And God has a big question for us all. Yes, indeed, we do have a God of second chances. May God bless the study of his word to us today.